Good afternoon. Today's lecture in our ITIL webinar series. My name is Franz Koenig from the Medical University of Vienna and of the ITIL project funded by the European Union. And this is joint work with several of my colleagues at the Medical University of Vienna, which I will introduce in a minute. The topic of my talk is the adaptive levels of evidence and we will propose an extrapolation framework to specify requirements for drug development in children. How do you use extrapolation to specify relaxed significance levels for trials in children? Good, so now we'll proceed to the second slide. Here you can see where we are in the webinar series and how our work package is embedded in the project. And on slide three, you can see the people I had the honor to work with in Vienna during the last three years. I would like to thank both PhD students, Gerald Lavigne, whom I call Mr. Extrapolation, and Sergei Krasnoson, who did both great work. Also in the core team was Emeritus Professor Peter Bauer, the grey eminence in the background, or the heart of the, our project, and we benefited a lot from his immense experience. For example, he was a statistical advisor for the pediatric committee at the European Medicines Agencies for many years, and as you will immediately see, some of the research presented today was inspired by his, ex by his experience and also by his ideas. In this respect, I would also like to thank Christoph Mahle, who is a pediatrician at our university, and he was the Austrian member in the PTCO for almost a decade. Also, I would like to thank particularly Martin Bosch, with whom we still worked closely together, so he was involved in the other EU projects. On slide four, you can see the agenda for today. To give some context, I will first give a short overview on the pediatric regulation in Europe and the development of guidance of, of extrapolation at the European Medicines Agency on this topic. Afterwards, I will introduce our quantitative concept for extrapolation. Uh, for many years in Europe, and I think the development in other regions was not much different, drugs were main, mainly tested in adults. This was justified by ethical concerns regarding research in children, but also because research in children is more difficult. For example, there may be only a small numbers of children that can be recruited into studies, but increased costs for drug developers, which may not be compensated by economic returns, especially if the disease is rare in children. As a result, many drugs were used off-label in children, no systematic dose finding was performed, and children were potentially exposed to unsafe or ineffective treatments. Off-label drug use remains an important public health issue for infants, children and adolescents because an overwhelming number of drugs still have no information in the labeling for use in pediatrics. To address these issues, in 2007, a milestone, uh, the pediatric regulation came into action in Europe uh, by the impression that market forces alone have proven insufficient to stimulate adequate research into and the development and authorization of medical products for pediatric population. So the European pediatric regulation requires that every developer of a medical product proposes in a pediatric investigation plan called FIP for the pharmaceutical and clinical development in children. This is done very early in the drug development process, already at the end of phase one of the adult development program, usually. This plan is then evaluated, agreed, modified, or declined by the pediatric committee called PDCO. Later modifications are possible if requested by the company and the outcome of this process is legally binding. A big challenge is the specification of the amount and type of studies that are requested in children. Can efficacy and safety be extrapolated from adults to children? So 
is a full drug development program needed in children, including preclinical research, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, dose finding studies, and two fully powered pivotal phase three studies, or is a related set or a single pharmacokinetic case series in children sufficient, or are even no studies in children required? To develop such a systematic approach, the EMA has just recently published a draft reflection paper where a framework to specify the requirements for the amount and type of data to be generated in the pediatric population is outlined. The reflection paper will be open for comments later this year. And if you look at the date when it was published, I really hope that the publishing date should not question the seriousness of the proposal. So I'm now on slide number six and uh, slide number eight. And the draft quotes a quite broad definition of extrapolation, which you can read yourself on the slide. So the main objectives to extrapolate are to minimize the number of children to be exposed to the risk and burden as clinical trial participants, to allocate the resources efficiently, for example, to start an age group where the uncertainty is largest, and to optimize decision making by making use of all available information. So the rationale is silly. We want to avoid unnecessary studies for ethical reasons and efficient resource allocation, and we want to optimize decision making when patients are scarred. So let's use all available information. So can one quantify the prior information on similarities? If you have a look in the draft again, the draft notes that such a quantitative approaches for extrapolation could be of interest. However, we are still in the early days of development and applying such quantitative methods. And in the remainder of this talk, I would like to sketch one attempt to drive such an quantitative approach. So I will now focus on a paper of us which, which has just been published in Statistics and Medicine. Uh, this is joint work with Gerald Labine, Christoph Malle, Martin Bosch, and Dieter Bauer. And you can access the paper freely from the Statistics and Medicine webpage. So the li link to, to the paper is given on the left hand side on this slide. And the paper is called Evidence, Eminence, and Extrapolation. So the question we ask is how to specify the level of evidence for trials in children. So consider the setting where a PIP is specified and data of pivotal trials in adults are not yet available. So the main question is, can we relax the standard significance level for pivotal trials in children, taking into account that the drug will have been approved for adults based on pivotal clinical trials, and results from future adult trials can be extrapolated to a certain extent to children. So how to choose the relaxed significance level? When approving the drug for children, our confidence in the efficacy of the drug in children should not be less than the confidence in efficacy of the drugs in adults. So, what is the probability that the drug is effective in adults given a successful adult development program? This probability, which we call 1 minus gamma A, consists of three ingredients. The first one is the significance level of adult development of the significance level of the adult uh, drug development program. The second ingredient is the power of the adult de development program. And the third one is the a priori belief before conducting the phase three trials in adults that the drug will be effective in adults, which we denote here is one minus R subscript A. 
So the first two ingredients are derived from the designs used in the clinical trial program. That's easy. However, the third part, the prior probability that the drug is effective, is much more tricky. So on the next slide, we will see two potential ways how to determine the prior probability that the drug works in adults. So how can we determine the prior probability for efficacy? 1 minus RA. So first, so one way uh, could be to examine expert opinions. So to by elicitation from expert knowledge, where you can use Bayesian tools to derive this value. Another way, so the second bullet point, is to use empirical data. For example, one could take the historical success rate in a specific indication. So for example, in oncology, uh, it might be known that 40% of new compounds entering phase three are proven to be effective under the assumption that the success rate is based on development with two pivotal trials, uh, both using an overall level of two times 0.025 and a power of 80%, then we can uh, derive that one minus RA would be 0.5. And now let's assume for the remainder of the talk that one minus RA is 0.5. And here we might ask the following question. What is our confidence for efficacy in adults? So given a prior belief, 1 minus R, A is 0.5, the confidence in efficacy conditional on a future successful adult, adult development program is, for example, 0.973 if we have just one single pivotal trial at the one-sided level of 2.5% and a power of 90% or 0.992 if two trials are performed such that the overall level is uh, 0.025 uh, to the power of 2 and then this results in an overall power of 80%. So how can you use this data to improve regulatory decision making in children? So where, where are we now? So far we have derived the, our priority belief that the drug will work in adults, which we called 1 minus RR. Then we assume that there will be a successful development in adults, which gives us the posterior in adults, which we denote by 1 minus gamma A. So how can we now extrapolate from adults to children? What is the confidence for efficacy in children conditional on a future su successful drug development in adults? Now, let the skepticism S denote the probability that efficacy in adults cannot be extrapolated to children, which means with a probability of 1 minus S the confidence and efficacy in adults can, is directly transferable to efficacy in children. However, with probability S, extrapolation can be applied and the confidence for efficacy in children needs to rely on other sources as well. Just a side remark, uh, that we call this parameter skepticism S might be related that we are not from an English speaking country as you can hear where in the language things would be expressed in a more positive way. However, this might be related that here in Austria we are always quite skeptical, like is the glass now half full or half empty? The German language, at least in statistics, sounds more negative. So in English we would say in survival analysis life table, whereas in German it is the other way around with Sterbetafel, literally meaning mortality tables. So instead of skepticism, we could have put it also the other way around, and formulate it more positively as optimism factor, if you prefer this way. But I will now stick to skepticism. So thus here, a higher value of S means that we are more skeptical, meaning that we believe more strongly extrapolation is not possible. So 
what is our early confidence that the drug works in children conditionally that in adults the drug development program will be successful? So the question is, is full extrapolation possible? If we say yes, with the probability of 1 minus s, then we have the same confidence for efficacy as in adults, so 1 minus gamma a. If we believe that no extrapolation is possible, then the confidence is 1 minus q, whereby this confidence has to come from other sources. For example, there is already a case series where we have some BK D data in children, which we can use to formulate this confidence uh, for the pediatric population. So, what's the overall early confidence for efficacy in children? This is quite simply, because this is simply a weighted mixture of these two probabilities, as you can see. So, 1 minus RC is uh, the, our early confidence that the drug will work in the pediatric population. Now I move to slide number 17. So let me again summarize where we are now in the extrapolation process. So we started with the prior in adults, then we assume that there will be a successful development program in adults. And now we would like to extrapolate the information which we have gained in, in adults to the pediatric population based on our skepticism that we have. And this will give us the prior belief that the drug will work in children, which we denote by 1 minus RC. So C should denote uh, that it, this is the parameter for the, for the children. So what this gives us then a posterior conf confidence that the drug works in children. So after a successful development program in children using an adjusted significance level alpha, we end up with the posterior confidence that the drug is really effective in children, which we denote by 1 minus gamma c. And now, the main question is, which significance level alpha adjusted do we need to apply in children to achieve the same confidence for, effic uh, for efficacy for children as for adults? So this means we have the confidence for efficacy in adults, 1 minus gamma a. Uh, we would like to have the same confidence for efficacy in children, so 1 minus gamma c. And now the solution of the equation below will give us an adjusted significance level for the better trial, resulting in the same confidence for adults and children after observing a positive program in both. So, on the next slide, so slide number 18, you can see the adjusted significance level depending on the skepticism factor S, which is shown on the x-axis. Remember, the higher S, the stronger our a priori belief is that the knowledge gained in adults will not be transferable to children. On the right-hand side, you can see how we specified uh, the various input parameters needed. So the red line is for a pediatric trial bought at 80%. The confidence in efficacy in adults is 0.973. So this means we assume that there was one bivalve phase 3 study and we targeted the same confidence in children. And for the beginning, our belief is zero that the drug would work in children if extrapolation was not possible. So this is the last bullet point. Now you can see that on the left hand side, the curve is quite steep, meaning small changes in S might have a huge impact on the adjusted significance level. However, this is not really a, a very desirable feature, as one might raise the question, can you really quantify S to some decimal places? I have my doubts. On the right hand side, the curve is more flat, 
and therefore less sensitive on small differences in S. Another interesting finding is that if we are very skeptic, then this results in a lower significance level than 2.5%. This is not unexpected, as we assumed that the probability of efficacy without extrapolation is zero, which means here we would need more data, so more, maybe even more than one study, which is then indicated by the lower significance level. Now let's see what happens if we vary some of the parameters, e.g. let's start with the targeted confidence and efficacy in children. So what if we allow such a targeted confidence and efficacy in children is different to the one in adults? And here you can see if we allow for lower confidence, let's say 0.95 or 0.9, then the curve moves up to the right and becomes less steep, which is a good feature. And now, what if there are also other sources available that the drug might work in children, even if extrapolation is not possible? This means that 1 minus Q becomes higher. So we now change the assumed probability of efficacy without extrapolation. So here you can see the curve of 0.25 of 0.5 and 0.75. Again, the curves move up to the right and become less steep. And if our prior belief that the drug could work in children without a positive program in adults, e.g. because we have some data due to off-label use, or some PKPD case series in children is 0.5, then the adjusted significance level is larger than 2.5% for almost the whole range of A's. So if you have some other data that the drug could work in children, even if there's no efficacy in adults, then with this approach, you would always result in a higher significance level. Good. If you want to explore the impact of these parameters more thoroughly, there's good news. So thanks to Gerald Halloween again, because he developed an online R shine extrapolation application, which you can access from the link below. But keep in mind, this is a better version, so we don't guarantee for anything. But it should deliver the correct results. Good. So. What is the impact of using our extrapolation approach in terms of sample sizes? For example, if the clinical trial conducted is a randomized clinical trial comparing the experimental treatment against an appropriate control group, so with a parallel group design, and we will compare our extrapolation approach using the adjusted level, as shown before, depending on the skepticism factor S, against a standard standalone randomized control clinical trial using the conventional one-sided level of 2.5, and in both cases, the studies are powered at 80%. So how does the sample size look like? On the x-axis, you can see the skepticism factor S again, and on the y-axis, you can see the relative sample size uh, where the standard RCT is the reference, which means a value smaller than one indicates that the extrapolation approach would require smaller sample sizes. And indeed, for our reference design, red line for small skepticism between 0.4 and 0.5 will have substan substantial saving of sample sizes. However, if there's some uncertainty left where the extrapolation is possible and as big is larger, larger sample size would be required to reach the targeted level of confidence in children. This is not unexpected, as we already saw that for higher values, a smaller significance level would be required. However, remember, we set 1 minus 2 to 0, and we would require the same confidence as for adults. If we relax this assumption, then the reduction in relative sample sizes becomes more pronounced. So let's again start with the targeted confidence in efficacy 
in children and EG for a targeted level of 0.9, only half of the sample sizes would be needed for a skepticism around 0.4. Also, if you think a priori that the drug would, could work in children, even if extrapolation from adults is not possible, things improve quite a lot, e.g. if we set 1 minus q to 0.5, we have a reduction in terms of sample sizes for the whole range of skepticism. So far, so good. So we as statistician, we all are quite convinced that randomization is a good thing. However, and we also have had work package one where also different randomized, also, also different randomization methods have been uh, compared in a, in a systematic way. However, in a small population and a vulnerable population like a pediatric population, we might not have enough patients for a randomized controlled clinical trial. So we come to the more tricky question whether enough patients for a randomized controlled clinical trial are really available in such a vulnerable small population. And in a paper which was initiated by Hans Georg Eichler, who is the senior medical director of CMA, we raised the question whether to perform an RCT or a single arm trial. As you all know, during the contact of the small population project, the EMA started the data transparency initiative, and this will already has a huge impact on the way we conduct clinical trials. And as in the future, more and more data will be publicly available. How can we use this data from other RCTs, like here from adults, or other sources like, 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 like clinical trial registries best? And in this paper, we suggest a framework on how to make best use of such available data and propose a framework. So in this framework, you need a protocol on how to select the controls first, then you define a threshold, then you conduct your single arm trial, and then you check whether you're successful by comparison against the threshold, and you might perform a further sensitivity analysis against the historical controls, but I will stop here. And if you are more interested in this topic, have a closer look at our paper, which has just been published yesterday with open access in clinical pharmacology and therapeutics. And again, you can find a link to the PDF uh, on the right-hand side of the paper. Good. Now let's come to a case study. It would be nice to have a case study to demonstrate how to determine the parameters S, Q, R in practice. However, unfortunately, there is no real case study yet, as the method has just been developed. So, in what follows, I'm going to present a hypothetical case study regarding the registration of Humara. So, in 2003, Adalimumab was registered at CMA for moderate and severe active rheumatoid arthritis in adult patients. In 2008, it was registered for genuine idiopathic arthritis based on a single randomized withdrawal study in pediatric patients. And this study was designed to control a significant level of 2.5% and a power of 80% for a 40% difference between treatments. A p-value of 0.0 one five for the primary outcome measure was observed, and it was agreed that this single successful confirmatory study is sufficient for registration. Now it has to be mentioned that all what I have just described is not hypothetical. It summarizes the actual registration process of Hamera. But now we ask, what is the largest skepticism S that is compatible with the study program that just requires a single study for registration in children. In this table, let's focus first on the middle column, which is highlighted in, in blue. So here you can see, again, the prior belief of efficacy in adults is 0.5.
and this results in a posterior in adults of 0.992 and under the assumption that for registration in children we need the same confidence as in adults, the skepticism as should not be higher than 0.024 to reach this targeted confidence with just a single study. So it's really, really low. In other words, one has to be 98% sure that full extrapolation from adults to children is possible. So this means if you would simply take a yes or no vote of board members such as the BDCO, as humans are about 40 members, already one to four negative persons will have such a huge impact. Furthermore, for different choices of prior beliefs in adults, this maximum skepticism this maximum skepticism, which are considered to be acceptable, very considerable from 0.178 to 0.003. However, so this is the last row, if on the other hand it is allowed to decrease the targeted level of confidence in children, this sensitiveness of the results on the chosen skepticism vanishes. So, how can we quantify the skepticism? This will be really a challenge to experts. So the elicitation of S will be informed by evidence synthesis concerning the disease, the patient population, the medical product. And what will be really helpful are modeling and simulation tools to predict the translation of treatment effects from adults to children. And you will also rely on expert opinion, which will, might scare some regulators, I think. Similarly, the parameters 1 minus RA, so the prior success rate of new compounds in adults, and 1 minus Q, the prior confidence in efficacy if extrapolation is not possible, need to be elicited. How can we quantify similarity? So here's the obligatory cartoon, what Gerald would say. So, what are the challenges in a potential regulatory application? The estimation of the parameters based on robust evidence synthesis methods taking into account pharmacometric modeling. The results may depend sensitively on the assumptions and the pediatric investigation plans, the PIPs, agreed on in early phases may need to be modified when data from studies in adults become available. However, Modifications of an approved PIP can currently only be requested by applicants. I will come back to this point on the next slide. And if data in adults become available, more sophisticated patient approaches may be applied to adaptively modify the pre-planned pediatric development program. So what we have now also suggested are, in addition to the usual PIPs, what we call RPIP, so Adaptive Pediatric Investigation Plans, which explicitly foresees re-evaluation of the investigation plan. And that's the main difference now. Modification can also be requested by regulators. And I'm not sure, again, if this is a desirable feature, because this means now, this is, uh, means that regulators would have to reassess the data on a permanent basis and this is in contrast to what is done now that only the CGP at the end of the day accesses all the data. So this is a more stepwise approach. So what is the advantage of the company because it might not be seen quite well by the sponsors that also now also regulators can request a modification. The benefit for the companies might be that these BIPs are more strategic, but less elaborated on details of studies to be planned. So some people might have some doubts whether it's really useful to do a detailed sample size calculation for a study which might be conducted in five, six years, because then the assumption might have changed quite dramatically. So here, this BIP should be more strategic. It should just justify the strategy and the timelines. And if there are pediatric trials, which start in parallel to the adult 
drug development program, we would propose to use also adaptive intra interim analysis in single trials. However, this would really require a change of the EU legislation, or at least a change of the way how the current legislation is interpreted and executed. And again, if you are interested, you find the link on the right hand side. It was published in pharmaceutical statistics. Good. So how to choose the level of confidence 1 minus gamma C? So is it really reasonable to require a confidence level of 0.9992 and 0.973 for drug licensing? It seems quite high. However, is it also reasonable to require a lower confidence level in a vulnerable population such as a pediatric population? Should the choice be based on decision theoretic approaches that quantify the costs of false positive and false negative conclusion, benefit and risk? So let me come to a, a summary. So our framework formally incorporates prior information and expert knowledge while still applying frequent testing, however, at a modified significance level. So, if you are interested in other highlighted, I have here selected some other highlights and also mentioned some of the collaborators uh, in Work Package 4. For example, Gerard also looked into the question how can we incorporate safety data in adapting the significance level when testing efficacy. Uh, Sergei looked in how to extend MCP mod to take a dose findings study also for confirmatory testing and how to uh, use adaptive interim analysis to redesign the dose findings study because keep in mind already the ICH E4 explicitly states that a dose finding study can be one of the pivotal studies and this in small populations we have to do this approach more frequently. We also looked in does it make sense to use response adaptive designs in small population. So here I have my doubts if it makes always sense. So also here Sergei did a great job. We also looked in more specific issues in adaptive designs with time till event points. So here I'd like to mention uh, Dominic Bagia, Thomas Jacke, or to be Matthias Brückner. And also one emphasis in the project was uh, can we identify a small subgroup where the drug works or works better and how can we do some confirmatory testing? So this is work done together with Martin Bosch, Alexander Graf, Thomas Andre, and I should also mention Carl Friedrich Burman and Sebastian Job Jorensen from another work which is an ideal to work together with the TIA group in, in small populations, Rob Beckman we mentioned here, and also Nigel Stallard from the Inspire project and also this Marco Schotter Bogdan from another work package in, in, in the idle project. So here at the end you can find a list of papers which came out of the project so far. So on slide number 33 I would like to explicitly mention the first paper because this gives so we tried to give a good overview on the development of adaptive designs over the last 25 years. And this paper was also discussed by other people, so you might still see that are quite split opinions on whether adaptive designs are. Uh, so, under which circumstances adaptive designs should be used. Which brings me to my last slide, so thank you for your attention. And if there are no questions, let me point out that next week there's really a highlight of the webinar series because Stephen Sam will give the next uh, webinar on Tuesday. So let me thank you for your patience and again. Good afternoon and good night. 
and if there are some questions simply let me know